In the next hour, uh, I will talk about uh, the origin of the fourth industrial revolution. Also, uh, starting how machines think in similar way as we think humans, uh, and how this symbiotic relationship in this new uh, industrial revolution uh, will bring us to this new world where the dilemma of either or, the philosophical dilemma of either or, either profit or impact, either logic or intuition, either digital or physical is blurring, and we are merging this all items together. So uh, I hope you enjoy. So I'll start with that we are today in a, as we've had in the past, in a new inflection point. And like every transition we had in the past, it's marked with big change and a need that has to be met. But let's go back a little bit in the history, actually a little bit far, 12,000 years ago. Uh, when the Earth had just undergone a major climate change and we got a less harsh and more stable climate. So we had four million uh, humans that shared this beautiful planet. Our ancestors, the hunter-gatherers, homo sapiens, they had this similar brain, but they were living in very different conditions. They um, lived in a in a um, symbiotic harmony with nature. They didn't feel like they are mastering nature like we feel in today, but they were part of the nature like the trees and other animals. The invention of fire and the settlement when the climate conditions settle, uh, they were the start and the fundamental of building societies in that age. So with the nice climate uh, and about 10,000 uh, years ago, they discovered this beautiful part in the Middle East, the Fertile Crescent area, where there was um, um, wild wheat, and that set the place for the next evolution um, that changed the human relationship with nature, mastering nature. The farmers, the agrarian society, which uh, prospered establishing a form of social organization characterized by the ownership of land, the establishing of religions, of marriage, uh, transferring land to our children, and that is uh, the, where the, the need of settlement and societal structure was born. We've been in this farmer era for very long, until 1760, the first industrial revolution. We went beyond mastering nature and uh, with the invention of the steam engine. We used water and steam uh, power to mechanize production and we also had a growing population that we uh, need to serve. And that was, um, to me, the first start of the next evolutions that happened. So in the second one, so by the 1870s, we saw the second industrial revolution uh, with the widespread adoption of technological systems such as the telegraph, sewage machines, and the use of electric power to crea create mass production. So, and what you saw really is kind of the uh, structure set by the farmers, farmers around the ownership of land transformed to different territories, which is the embryonic hierarchical leadership model we saw uh, developed, dividing work into specialties and into areas. Everyone has their own territory. For example, in healthcare, you, you have specialties. Every doctor has a specialty with specific organ instead of seeing a human as a holistic uh, human being. So that is when uh, we see that model from the farming transferring further into our industrial life. Then comes the third industrial revolution, the digital revolution. As uh, most of us witnessed that in late 1900s, 1989 and the 90s, where uh, we saw the spread of electronics and the information technology, so our economy was driven by information. This technology has been used to expand the possibilities for people, uh, not only in business, but also for leisure, for travel, and to, Im to improve our uh, quality of life. So this evolution of this digital revolution, what we did uh, from an IT perspective, we were programming machines with, with rules. It was human rules, human intelligence, programmed into computers. There was no artificial intelligence in there. It's all human, but then programmed. But this new era where we are now, we are far from the rule-based approach. 
in the fourth industrial revolution that actually for me started a while back, but the inflection point is 2020 with the pandemic and all what happened around the world. And it is characterized by a different symbiotic relationship, not only with nature this time, between humans and machines. So machines are not programmed by rules. They learn by themselves. They learn from data. And we have not only human intelligence, but also a different type of intelligence. And this phase, we have also global issues that were co caused by the previous revolutions from climate change, from inequality in the world, from healthcare, and it's all on the shoulders of this generation to solve. And with this uh, new revolution, the goal is how can we orchestrate both human intelligence and artificial intelligence to solve these big problems? So, we are, but every inflection point, there is some type of crisis going on. We see that we've uh, had time that the pandemic outbreak caused tremendous loss of human life and froze the economy, uh, the threat of an incoming geopolitical war and the reality that we are facing of climate change will inevitably put uh, life as we know it at risk. And this big change is the time also, and also the science of the big inf uh, inflection point that is going on. I was born in 1983. The world population back then was about 4.7 billion people on this planet. My parents, they were born in the mid-50s. They were about 2.8 .8 billion, so it's doubling in every generation. The world population today will increase by 2 billion in the next 30 years. But during the course of the 21st century, the, the world population growth will slow down. It's not the same exponential curve as we had in the previous revolutions. The focus will shift of the evolution of the human race, as well as economy, will no longer be based on how to accelerate production, because we will be peaking at 10.9 billion by 2,100. So, this um, uh, progress and acceleration of production or an, an economy, uh, will, we will need to focus instead on how to protect our planet for the uh, future generation, how to live in harmony with nature. Actually, we are going back to live similar to our hunter-gatherer ancestors, but in a world not only run by humans, um, human intelligence, but also artificial intelligence. So how can we bring that symbiotic relationship with nature back? So this new industrial revolution, uh, we hope that it's going to bring that symbiotic relationship between humans and the planet to solve big problems that we caused in the previous industrial revolution, to allow us to move from a volume-driven economy to, for mass production to meet the growing population to an outcome-driven economy. For example, in healthcare, we are talking uh, how can we move from paying for the drug to paying for the patient to get better. And the same discussions is happening for transportation, not only paying for to move from point A to B, but also to pay for a reduced CO2 impact that we are causing with transportation. AI will lead to this translation of of business models from this volume to the value driven and also will lead us to more equitable digital economy and society by allowing us to predict outcomes beforehand and be able to price uh, products uh, in the different ecosystems in the right way. So combining profit with respect for nature, reducing waste uh, and the conscious use of resources and the shift to renewable energy is what this technology is enabling us to do in this uh, new era of the fourth industrial revolution. So for example, in healthcare, we've been a lot talking about prevention. If you look at our healthcare systems today, they are actually about sick care. We wait for people to get sick, to treat them. But now, with the help of AI, we can be able to predict. So we can move from uh, sick care to prevention, to healthcare. And, um, and that is the, the, the big shift that this technology is helping us to uh, come. So where is it coming from? I mean, the father of AI, is Alan Turing, was the first to ask the question, can machines think? 
And in his seminal work, he offers a set, the Turing test, where a human interrogator would try to distinguish between a computer and a human text response. A computer program was considered intelligent if it can trick the interrogator into believing it's a human. Today, if you look to the applications of AI across all the uh, applications from healthcare to manufacturing, it doesn't really require to pass the Turing test anymore because machines took a different role than the human in this uh, evolution. Machines have developed and already, in some areas, beaten humans, where there is high computing component, but in some areas took completely a different role. So let me give you examples from healthcare. Areas where, for example, AI beaten humans is, for example, in radiology, in detecting tumors, where AI can learn from a large data uh, sets to detect in tumors, and um, a human uh, life, uh, even we cannot learn all uh, uh, from all the volume as AI uh, would learn. So we, we see there that there is a huge uh, potential for AI to transform this field. Other applications that AI took different uh, in healthcare, for example, taking all the mundane tasks from doctors and from healthcare professionals, for example, in triaging patients into serious cases and routine cases. And that's also where I see huge efficiency win for artificial intelligence that can bring to our daily life. All the mundane tasks that can be automated with high computing systems will be replaced with artificial intelligence. So, what we really see is that machines are taking different role in this fourth industrial revolution. Machines are high at, uh, good at high computing, high granular tasks, very goal-oriented, and humans are good with their intuition, emotional intelligence, moral values, and drive for outcome and strategy. And we will see across the different organizations and different functions, we will see these uh, roles shifting uh, in, in, the, in the future. So one of the important laws, when I was a student, uh, we learned about Moore's law by 1965, the strict definition of doubling chip densities every two years that allowed us to get to the high computing power that we have today. Uh, AI is not new. In the 80s, there was a big boom around using neural networks for processing and for applications, but it didn't succeed because of the low computing power. It didn't have the same, it took very long to, for a program to run. That's why uh, we focused uh, on rule-based system. But now, although Morse working is not completely, uh, uh, is now slowed to roughly 30%, uh, but thanks to the high computing power we have today, we can build machines that can go beyond rules and that can process a lot of data and learn from observations, similar way as we learn, and no longer needing the human to design the rules. And that is really a big shift that uh, got us to this new um, evolution. So in, uh, to give you an example of this shift from rule-based to um, uh, learning from observation, in 1984, when the book The Policeman's uh, Beard is Half Constructed by Rector was published, a collection of surrealistic poetry, no one knew that Rector was not a human poet. A Rector, uh, short for raconteur, was an algorithm. It could create sentences randomly, correctly, uh, but human developers, um, back in the 80s, they had to choose uh, the sentences and compile uh, the book. So it was a rule-based system. Uh, but today, AI-powered programs like Verse by Verse composes poetry inspired by classic American poets at real-time speed and receiving only little human input and delivering an amazing uh, amazing poetry. So this is an example of the shift that happened, and this is just one of thousands. So let's look how it all started. I'm sure that throughout the hundred thousand odd years of, of our species uh, existence, our ancestors looked, our hunter-gatherer ancestors looked to nature and wondered if what they see was real or it was just their perception. As humans, we do see the world patterns created by the law of nature 
Or do we see it by us? Is it really what we see? Is it there? Is it a real chair or is it a, a, my imagination? How do we convert a set of observations into concepts in our brain? How do we learn from experience? How do we learn from all the streets in the world that we are in a new street? How do we recognize that? How do, does this knowledge grow to experience and to learnings? That is exactly the transfer or the transition we made to get to AI. So, um, long time ago, as, uh, when I was younger, I went to Kenya, I went to safari, and I saw an elephant uh, 300 meters away, and we drove away, and the elephant got smaller and smaller until I couldn't see it anymore, but I believe it's still there. Could I be wrong? Could I be misinterpreting the nature of my perception? So, and that is the question, the fundamental question that we need to answer to build AI system. How do we, as humans, how do we have this miraculous ability to recognize an animal we never saw before just because we know a few other animals that we recognize? How can we recognize the tree from its leaves? How can we recognize the daughter in the habits of her mother? How can we recognize the poet from his metaphors? How can we recognize the painter from his brushwork? If you look at that, we consciously make observations all the time since we were born on animals, on trees, on people, on pieces of art and metaphors. And unconsciously, these observations are organized in our brain into groups, into concepts, into classes. And when we encounter a new member of this class, even if we don't know, I've never seen before, we recognize it and can assign the class name while classifying observations. And that is exactly the fundamental goal of AI. Can we do this with AI? Can we teach AI to recognize objects it's never seen before by giving it a load of info, observations and training it. This miraculous ability to recognize is called generalization. It's a remarkable feature of the human brain. And it's the cornerstone of human intelligence. In pattern recognition, generalization underpins the capability to generalize concepts and objects from a, a set of observation. And it's miraculous not just because of this feature, but also for us humans that we are conscious about it and aware of it, which is, in the case of machine, impossible. We are recognized, but they are not aware of it. And so this skill of generalization constitutes the basis of any science, any religion, any story that has been ever told, every village, every city. So the question is, how do we do this as humans? Mathematically, how do we do this? How do we come from observation to generalization. How can we transfer this to machines? So, is generaliz generalization a skill that uh, only human have, or can we give it to machines? AI systems learn from data we feed it. They are able to recognize the learnings into patterns similar to us. So we want to use mathematics to mimic this ability to recognize specific objects into our world, into this uh, new world where we are, in similar way um, we do as humans. So to develop this, uh, this capability into machines, we had to um, do something, which is, uh, is not, sorry. Yeah, so we had to develop um, new techniques and new distance metrics, um, and we had to mathematically disobey a very important theorem, the Pythagoras theorem. I don't know why the video is not playing, apologies for that. So yes, uh, to build, and you heard it correctly, to build intelligent machine, machines, we had to uh, disobey one of the important theorems, which is the shortest distance between two lines is not a straight line. Pythagoras, as you know, was obsessed with triangles. With, uh, he is the father of Euclidean distances. And um, why do we do disobey uh, this 
Pythagoras theorem, when it comes to uh, automation of decision making, what we do all the time when we are um, recognizing objects, we do pair matching. We try to match one object to another. Um, and the, 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 the way we do pair matching, we use distances. So we, uh, two distances that are close together will lead us to the same object. So distance metrics are used to measure the distance between two points in our feature space, in our world, so, so we can automate recognition of objects uh, in artificial intelligence. The Euclidean metrics, which, which is based on the shortest distances, um, the, um, the distance between two points is the shortest distance, are very strict and refer to um, a triangle inequality. And if you look here, um, so there are three types of metrics. The, the Euclidean ones, there is um, no Euclidean metrics, but there are um, even uh, more extreme non-Euclidean known metric um, distance, distances that we use, which disobey um, the Pythagoras theorem. So what distance metrics are the best for real world? When we judge people, when we judge streets, when we judge trees and daughters in the habits of their mother, which one will work the best? So there was um, a paper that I really liked uh, and was published in 2014. Um, they did um, synthesizes a, a large data on real-world applications, and their conclusion was good recognition is known metric. It doesn't obey the triangular inequality. So, and an, an example: um, every uh, when you are traveling with uh, the navigating system, the shortest distance to get from A to B is always through a detour to another point. And similar for surgery. If you go straight to the organ, you might hurt other organs and you've got to fix them. But if you find the best route, it will be the shorter way to, uh, to get to the organ. This is the reality that we need. This is the mathematical translation we need to bring to AI so we can measure what is similar and what is not. So imagine we train an, a machine learning algorithm to determine how likely the, pic, the picture on the left is the same person as the one on the right. If we apply the triangle inequality, the distance between the two pictures on the right is actually smaller than the distance between each one of them with the photo on the left. So, and that is the conclusion that the known Euclidean metrics, which res respect Pythagoras theorem, do not stand in example. So in real world application, Pythagoras got it wrong. Sorry, Pythagoras. Every um, moment we live uh, is never equal to, the, to any moment in the past. There is always dissimilarities. Um, every street, every tree, every person we met is different from uh, that we have ever seen before. So how do we know that this new place where we find ourselves is street? How do we? know that the person standing in front of us is a person. So to obtain good recognition, as uh, we learned, we need to use non-metric uh, approaches. And um, good recognition doesn't satisfy this metric. So if we um, want to learn what is next after generalization, what else can this machine offer that is similar to our brain? The next thing is uh, how these machines are similar to us is in the power of the faster thinking of our uh, unconscious brain. Numerous processes in our brain occur automatically without the involvement of our consciousness, preventing the mind from being overloaded uh, with all the simple routine tasks. You don't think if you are eating or if you are biking, those tasks you, you, you trained your brain to pick them up, up automatically to not overload your conscious brain. Similarly, AI functions using probabilistic thinking, so we are almost building a faster uh, unconscious brain into our society, into the different applications where we apply AI. So um, an example to demonstrate the, the power of, uh, uh, of this, if I showed you this chess layout uh, for five seconds, could you reproduce it? Studies show that most chess novices can recreate 25%. Of, of it, but chess masters do it with 95% accuracy. So the, the masters don't have a photo, photographic memory, but they simply use their knowledge. 
and their training based on patterns they have seen over uh, the years. And just discussion before this, this meeting, experts that are expert in, in specific tasks, like in surgery or in other uh, fields, when you ask them how they do an, a maneuver, it's very hard for them to articulate it. They've been trained and trained, and they do it. But to articulate it in rules, like in the previous digital revolution, is very difficult. So what we actually moved in this phase, we moved from easy to articulate tasks to tasks that require training. That is the level of automation we crossed with AI. So um, this is another example uh, of machines that can play strategic games. AlphaGo is a computer program that plays the board game Go, developed by DeepMind. Uh, subsequent versions were completely self-taught without learning from human games, and we will see more and more of that in inter entertaining application. So how um, AI is bringing this fast thinking into our world? When, when it comes to complex decisions like buying a house or getting married, or many believe that you know, if I make an Excel sheet and think about all the pros and the cons, I will make the best decision. Uh, but um, studies found that participants making very important decisions actually made better choices when they went for their intuition. However, simple decisions like buying a toothpaste or buying uh, today television, that is uh, better to be very to be with an Excel sheet, to be very uh, consistent and to have that. So, and this is proven with AI. When we have a complex data and we have a lot of features, like in drug discovery or in other fields, it's best to apply feature selection before, to identify the key variables that contain the important information and use only those to train the algorithm. So we're actually implementing more of the uh, uh, unconscious or the fast thinking power into those algorithms. So those key variables provide better accuracy of the AI systems than if you use all the data that is available. Uh, also, a nice example to, uh, to uh, share with you on the strength of the intuition. Um, there was a study where uh, recorded voices of different uh, people and then made them hear their voices. 75 of the participants in a study made a mistake in recognizing their own voice. But when we put a sensor, a stress sensor called skin conductance to measure um, their level of, of arousal, um, it was detected, it was the highest when their own voice was playing. So the intuition was strong, but it was ignored by their uh, conscious brain because they were thinking. So that is one of the things now where AI is going to be very good in detecting these signals and bringing the intuition back into our business and uh, into our lives. And when we are in the uh, learning or training mode, um, our brains are in this slow mode thinking. So when I'm learning driving or biking, you are with your conscious brain, you are thinking about the logic, but once you've learned, it's your uh, unconscious brain that's taking over. So when we master this skill, as I said, it's, it's more we're do it, doing it automatically. Um, and that is one of the important things that with AI, we are bringing, automating a big part of that and able to detect emotions, as we will see in some examples. And, and we can create many products and many services because of, of this in creating this gut feel, intuition into our uh, society. Recent work aimed to design algorithms for, for example, classifying emotions, uh, building this intuition, uh, from facial expression, from body language. Sometimes it's difficult to articulate what you feel, but from the sensors around us, we can easily detect those feelings. And there is a wide of range of applications where this could be applied, not only in education, but in, in various uh, levels. So really bringing that intuition back and just imagine the range of applications that could be, uh, uh, could be used. So now let's go a step back and think, where is this coming from? We saw all these evolutions, and, but what are the philosophical developments that lead us to machine learning? We have 
given two systems of thinking, conscious and unconscious, logical and intuitive, slow thinking and fast thinking. But let's revisit the origin of this dilemma from the philosophical perspective. Um, the, this tale of dichotomy separated the two most famous schools of thought in history uh, of philosophy, logical, logic and intuition. We need to put our intuition back as we see in the center of this uh, industrial revolution. Uh, now we have the technology that can allow us to do that. Fast thinking, intuition into machines. So Plato, the father of intuition, uh, automated subconscious thinking, suggests all, uh, that we all carry in us imprints and ideas in their pure form untouched by contingencies of space and time. So we are born with this uh, carrying inside of us some knowledge from uh, nature, the image of, uh, for example, of what is a table, uh, this, what we call a priori knowledge, that's born with us. This, makes, this is what makes us able to recognize an object um, or to have a feel for what is right and what is wrong. However, Aristotle did not agree and suggested as the foundation of our thinking is logic, the ability to observe things and deduce the conclusions based on rational exploration of this phenomenon. So Aristotle, the father of reason, from its theology to its science, fully embarrassed the idea that this is how human cognition works. So what else is science other than the ability to deduce uh, conclusions based on observation? Another philosopher, philosopher I want to bring to the table is Søren Kierkegaard. And uh, there are, by the way, many uh, absurd philosophers that um, tried um, to emphasize also the same idea of either or. You cannot have both things, you have to choose. Um, uh, to answer Aristotle's question, how should we th live? So for uh, Kierkegaard, the dualism between intuition and logic can be compared to the concept of what he described as aesthetic life, pleasure, and ethical life that mark human existence. So the aesthetic life uh, is uh, personal, subjective. It's where each person extracts pleasure, but you cannot have it all. If you choose for that, you will miss the ethical life. The ethical relief is the conscious choice, the choice to choose this is where the values and the identity of an individual uh, are judged by the objective world. So you've got to choose, either or. So I believe we are, for the first time in history, we don't have to prioritize one side at the expense of the other. The era of either or is over. We are entering the era of and both. With technologies such as AI, where you can train a system for impact and combine both sides of the middle, both approaches from learning from observations like Aristotle said, but also using a priori knowledge, giving pictures about the same object, for example, the same table, which, which is given by the, uh, to the algorithm. The data we decide to feed these algorithms will allow us to combine both. So it is the irony of the circle of history that products of hard science, AI, will bring these two philosophers back together and bring back the intuition into our life. So with AI, it's now possible to combine you know, the logic and the intuition and to develop a theory. And this theory can be put to the test with various data sets. We can test how accurate the system can predict emotions, can predict outcome for patients, can predict the learning for a child. And now if we look to business, where I'm coming from, when we undergo and help my clients to undergo digital transformation, it's very important to build this intuition back. A lot of this knowledge has been transferred from human to human. Now we have the ability to build this memory and this brain in those organizations that's been running for hundreds of years just by human transferring knowledge to each other. Now we have the opportunity to bring that DNA and build that memory there to support the new workforce. I work with life science companies 
And most life science companies today are relying on either single human intelligence or collective human intelligence. We didn't achieve yet human-machine uh, collaboration. Let me tell you how we work uh, at Okra. We are uh, engineers, we develop AI systems, we help life science companies to enable human-machine intelligence in their organizations. We take mundane tasks around commercialization, bringing a drug to market, and AI simulates hundreds, thousands of scenarios and provides the best um, suggestions to the user. So we understand that every pharma company is unique, every drug, every treatment is unique. So we support uh, our users to augment their decision making and using his, all the historical data from past successes and past failures to create these actionable insights for them. So that is an example from a business to business scenario, uh, but there are so many that we are actually still scratching the surface of this uh, industrial revolution. Uh, we now have in algorithms already integrated in a big part of our life, but mostly on the consumer side, when, when we are using our mobile devices for search or for booking our travel. And, um, but it will go to another level. Uh, AI is going to play a pivotal role at every moment. We saw that the applications that, will, that really requires AI, unfortunately, AI is not there in healthcare, in education. How can we move to the next level? So it's mostly today using in for, for the, the consumer space, which we actually need to change. We saw multiple applications ranging from um, uh, AI helping diagnose and mental health. For ch it was amazing to see that for children, they had this natural way to speak freely to uh, robots than uh, grown-ups. And th this, is, um, this is one of the shifts in behavior and interaction we're going to see in this uh, evolution, having this symbiotic relationship with the machines. And if we uh, so far have shaped the machines into, in our image, soon the dialogue will continue the other way around. It's a matter of time before the machines will start shaping us back. We saw also examples in farming, uh, how AI is uh, being used for precision farming to ensure the maximum use of fertilizers and maximum output of analyzing the ground and air quality. Of course, we heard a lot and we saw the, a lot of talk about self-driving cars. Um, companies like Google, Swimo have already created fully autonomous cars, but not yet available to purchase. So the technology is there, and techniques developed for intelligence cars are already used for uh, traffic management. So just imagine this world where will we have um, both humans and AI in the roads, in, at work, uh, in the schools, in the hospital. We also saw during the pandemic the shift to uh, all the online um, uh, meetings and uh, how uh, uh, with AI translation will not be an issue. Now we see it mostly in the business context where those um, platforms translate in real time, but uh, soon we will see it on, on, uh, uh, on the consumer side will minimizing the language barrier wherever you travel. Uh, and it's gonna be a fundamental uh, to further international collaboration and uh, critical for achieving our 2030 goals on that aspect. The world will be a small village with uh, this shift. So if robots can substitute us, this technology will eventually reshape what it means to be human. So um, of course, there is also skeptics around how this technology uh, can uh, become a total domination and evil machines. But uh, there, there is also optimism how this level of automation will free up some of the repetitive work and let us focus on what really matters. So I believe, uh, I'm a pragmatic, and I believe that we should seize this opportunity to guide this technology to the right direction and to, um, to protect our planet, to drive our uh, developments as humans and push for our values 
uh, in all sectors that are important. So one of the most striking results of blurring the lines between physical and uh, real, as we understand, it will fuse these two worlds together. And um, generations living on this planet at the moment still carry mem memories of our analog lives. And soon our children have, will have no such recollection. They will have only memories of this blurred life Machines helping us, and we are helping the machines. AI is us, and we are AI. It will be so blurred world, and uh, that is the future that at the moment looks scary, looks uh, far, but it is not that far. We will be at equal familiarity also with our physical body. We've heard a lot of discussions about the metaverse, some of it real, some of it not, but one day uh, we, we see already in healthcare, for example, how 3D printing can help us in um, organ trans, uh, transplation, I cannot pronounce the word, and how we can augment our uh, science with that. So moving to really this physical, uh, combining the physical and the digital, it's going to impact a lot of our uh, world. And not only the serious applications, also on the um, uh, art and the literature, you will go to an art gallery where uh, robots have made um, uh, art. Uh, we already see robotic arms mimicking the artist's gestures and creating arts that's combined between humans and machines. Um, in the same way, we will, see, we will read books that were written by AI and really have, we can choose where to pick and how to be inspired. No difference in music. Uh, we, there is already AI used to uh, combine with humans to um, direct the beats, permanent the tones, AI systems providing creative outputs within the bounds of those directions. So we will have a lot of uh, content created uh, from both humans and machines and combined. So the last few years we saw that our generation has been tested by facing a number of uh, crises in a short amount of time. Financial insecurity, um, geopolitical redrawing, the pandemic, and adding to the constant uncertainty is the development of these exciting technologies we've been talking about, which of their promise and potential could be the solution or take a dark turn. So without doubt, AI comes at a time where radical, brave solutions are necessary if we are to save our planet and survive as species and correct the many mistakes we made in the past. So it is predicted that this technology will play the central role of the catalyst in moving us away from the abysses and solving those pressing issues. issues. So just to give you some examples, in business, we are um, rethinking how business is designed, managed, and ev uh, evaluated. What we've been doing, we've been only chasing profit for, for uh, all this time, and that's no longer the option not only because the population is uh, uh, plateau plateauing, but also because we have to prioritize goals around uh, climate change, around healthcare, and improve lives for the many, uh, uh, for the common good. And it, because it's no more acceptable to not have impacts for the future generation. So profit needs to come with impacts. AI will also help us improve the human capital by offering new ways of training the workforce. Because it's no longer that we have to train the, the workforce one time or two times in a generation time, we have to do it very uh, uh, more frequently than in the past. Because many of the tasks we are doing will be automated. And overall, it seems likely that AI has significant potential to boost this productivity, but also enable this um, upskilling of our workforce. In healthcare, the, the impact is huge. Not only allowing us to move finally from sick care to uh, healthcare, but also really taking all the amount of mundane tasks that are uh, taking physicians' times 
uh, from screening to diagnosis and also allowing to a holistic view uh, of the human into predicting what is the risk for developing diseases and what is the best treatments possible. So, um, and that is a really a huge shift from, from where we are right now. All decreasing the time of clinic visits by 80% and decreasing the number of staff will be the early wins from an efficiency perspective and the long-term shifts will be moving to the prevention side and the early uh, disease detection. Without missing the sustainability goals where um, AI will unlock the potential to, ach to achieve um, um, cloud seeding, smart irrigation, but also uh, on the climate change, the application of predicting uh, the energy, the CO2 emissions, and enabling more greener uh, society and protecting the environment to get us to reach the net, ze net zero carbon by uh, 2050. So final example is from the education where uh, we need AI so much to get to our children personalized learning approaches based on every uh, child's own needs, unique experience and preferences. If you look to the schools today, it's really still based on the first and the, actually the second industrial revolution. It's like factory, like a clock in clock out system. People sit, you do the job, but that didn't make the shift. And where a tremendous shift will come with AI is to bring that um, access, 24-7 access, um, um, teaching across that the geographical boundaries will not be an issue, but also bringing the personalization to, uh, to teaching, which actually where it is needed and where we need more effort there. So to, to close uh, this um, presentation, uh, we saw that humanity traveled long way to get us here, to get us to um, this stage where it's not more about either or, either we go for logic or intuition, or either for profit or impact, or either for digital or physical. We are having the tools, and this new industrial revolution is bring us to this end, um, both era, where we need to combine both logic and intuition, both profit and impact, both digital and physical worlds, to save our planet, to live in symbiotic relationship and get closer to our um, uh, bringing the, the fusing, the honoring our farmer genes in parallel with the adventurous, close to nature, hunter gatherer uh, society's values. We will create, uh, and I believe, a much more uh, fair world and um, uh, close and symbiotic world with this technology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lubna. It, um, I'm very interested in how you predict how we interact with this world of machine learning. I mean, much of the, you know, we've all got devices now and uh, they're sort of fixed in time. But what's your perception of how as the next decade rolls by, we'll be interacting with all of this. So uh, I think at the moment it's mostly in a screen. We, we use algorithms, most of the algorithms we use are kind of either in a computer or in a phone, but later it will be everywhere. It will be in, a, in the cars, it will be when we interact, uh, uh, where we are uh, teaching children, where we're in the hospital. So it will be a big part of our life. And we see children, they have that natural interaction with robots than we do because we are still programmed uh, to have mostly with human interaction. But that is not the case for the new generation. It will be really blur, blurring interaction and it will be... Um, a difference will be maybe even easier to talk to a robot for a child than to to talk to someone where they feel is they're gonna be judged. So it's it's very uh, it's we cannot even imagine how that's going to be for the future generation. So I, I'm I'm concerned not concerned it's the wrong word. I'm I'm trying to understand how in that environment I will know what's true. Do you know it now? No, but I mean, if you if you 
the, the model you described, there's a sort of greater memory. I mean, I think any of us who use Google every day wonder why we ever bother with memory. But if you, if you in this world where we're interacting with some abstract thing, which I struggle with, how are you going to know to be able to filter out from that what is generated by an algorithm you can't see or machine learning that you don't know about from Donald Trump putting something on Twitter somewhere else? How do we differentiate the two things? I think accountability, so that brings me to, to the ethics of AI. I think it's very important when we build AI systems to build it with the framework of, of ethics uh, around uh, it needs to be uh, unbiased and it will actually, if you look, it will help us to become more unbiased society because as humans we inherit a lot of conscious bias. But now with the data we can balance the classes when we train so we can get to um, um, a fairly unbiased AI system by, and we can measure that and train that. Uh, the accountability side, there will be, of course, um, good applications but also bad applications. That is not something, we cannot stop that from happening. But what is um, important is to have that framework or almost that um, environment where we uh, put assign the right roles for the right uh, uh, agents. So there are some roles where machines are good at. Uh, it's the high computing, the uh, goal-oriented tasks, and there are goals where we always need a human to be accountable. It's always you need to be to have a human in the loop. You cannot uh, uh, leave just a child with a robot. There should be a context for that. So thank you for a very um, interesting talk, touching on lots of different aspects of the question. Um, on the more theoretical side of the question, at the beginning of your speech, you seem to place an upper limit to the development of artificial intelligences, the two being emotional intelligence and the second one being self-awareness. How do you explain the fact that you place that upper bound? Is it simply this industrial revolution? Would it be the subject of the next one? How do you see those questions? Um, so what I see uh, AI taken from us, as, as I shared in the presentation, so taking um, the recognition gen generalization, so the way we uh, generalize uh, from one object that we can uh, detect a new street or a new uh, object. So that uh, characteristic is now inherited by machines, uh, not in a rule-based fashion, but in a learning from observation fashion similar to us. Uh, the other element that is similar to us humans is the fast thinking. So the, uh, the power of, of the brain that is taking, the, the automatic brain, uh, and, and bringing more of those tasks, but not outside of our brain, but in an AI system. So that is really powerful, uh, because it will free up more of our conscious uh, brain that we can focus on more important things in this um, uh, revolution. I cannot predict what is next after this, because this is already a huge shift and there will be a lot of applications that's going uh, where this is going to apply. Uh, what is next? That, that I, I don't predict. Uh, thank you. Um, it's a brave new world you describe, but you do not take into account the, or you do not address the social implications of this. Uh, we talk about a population reaching 10.9, 11 billion. We are not all alphas, we're not even all betas. There are an awful lot of people who will not educationally, mentally, socially, psychologically be able to fit into this. You talk about children being conversant with uh, robots, but those children will not all grow up equally. I can see a time where there will be a percentage of people, the alphas and betas of this world, who will do very nicely out of it, and it will all be very clever. But there will be a large tranche of people who are excluded. And you see that today, when things were mechanized, you can no longer get a job in a factory because it's done by robots. And I see this as a significant shift even further in that direction. We will end up with 8 billion people very well off, and four billion people trying to burn them down. Thank you. I completely agree that inequality is a big issue 
in our world. And uh, I, I wouldn't say it's caused by this industrial revolution, it's caused by the previous ones. And I actually started in farming already with the landowners. So um, I, um, I also see where this is going. Uh, that also it's, it's, it's given more advantage to the betas of the world. Um, I um, also believe we, we can use it. Uh, the, the, the level of access this technology is given, the borderless access, that now children in refugee camps can follow courses with their tablet, um, or um, uh, that it is not more... Uh, 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 geographical barriers are not a problem. And also countries where there is no infrastructure, the legacy is becoming problem problem with countries where there is a whole legacy of systems. It is a big problem and we need all scientists, not only uh, AI scientists, we need scientists from all the disciplines, the ethicists, the philosophers, the social scientists, everyone to work together to shape the direction where we're going in this industrial revolution, which I believe we're not doing good enough because the systemic change is going to happen. We cannot limit limit the change that is coming. Always regulation is running behind innovation. So innovation is coming like a wave to us, like a tsunami. We need actually to move at the same pace. Moore's law is exponential and we are linear human beings. So we need to find a way to, to be able to adapt and change faster. As, as you mentioned, the uh, workforce we need to upskill people multiple times in one generation time. So we need to move, and we are too slow to change with the pace of this technology. And yes, I agree we need to be preparing for that, and we need to be working for that. We are, when we are seeing, to some extent, um, some of the arguments you put forward in, in countries which have very advanced technology with a very aggressive use of machine learning and artificial intelligence at least, if not true machine learning. For example, in the way that China is running a surveillance state. And so at one extreme, you have um, a controlling environment which keeps its people under control. And on the other one, the, the model that you're yeah. describing, which is one which liberates people to do what they want. Mm -hmm. And some middle ground in there is very difficult to, I to agree. understand. Yeah. I believe the AI is inheriting the values of the humans that are building it because it's an outcome-driven technology. You do need to define what is your outcome. You want to reduce uh, CO2 or you want to improve patient outcomes or you want to track people. Mm. So it's going to be used for the different types of applications. But I believe, uh, for example, in Europe we have strong values uh, and we are leading that discussion around how can we use AI for good how can we drive that? So uh, we cannot stop it. That is one thing that we should... Uh, uh, we need to find a pragmatic way to drive this technology to the right direction. We cannot um, hide it under the sheets. We cannot block its development. It will come from all the way. But we should direct it in the right way. As much as it will bring good applications, there will be, sadly, other applications like the uh, monitoring and... Uh, 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 autonomous weapons and all the types of applications that we are not happy with. And that is, um, yeah, for every technology the case. So in, in your world of people doing machine learning, which is clearly um, a special world, how, how is that framework of, I'll say, um, not ethics because it's something wider, it's morality that sustains the way you interact with each other and what you all want to do? How is that taken forward in, say, the next World Congress of Machine Learning? How would that be discussed? Yeah, I think um, it's in the environment where uh, I work, uh, but I am a little bit uh, maybe biased here because I was working uh, on developing the ethical guidelines with the commission and all my environments is, is our, in our DNA to make our AI explainable, to make it transparent, to avoid the black box approach. Uh, so it is, um, it is a topic of, uh, for example, in my company, every uh, engineer and data scientist, it's the key element to have all these uh, implemented in place. And it's... Uh, 
uh, it's very, and, and it's a debate now, everyone is talking, and in your, the company, you don't only have engineers, you also have ethicists, you have uh, red teams to test the algorithm for bias and for, uh, so it's, uh, the discussion is there in all conferences where we are discussing AI, it's a, a big topic, how, how do we do that? How um, do we tra test our algorithms for bias? How we ex make it explainable? Um, but yeah, you cannot control. Uh, th that is my viewpoint, and I might be in eternal vision. I well, I, I doubt it. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm afraid the auto uh, automatic intelligence of our clock has beaten us. Yes, and, uh, <laughs> I, have, I have to draw it to a conclusion. Lubna, thank you very much, and please join me in thanking Lubna Booth for one more. Thank you. Thank you.